a developed country like England, we shouldn't have 320,000 homeless people. It shouldn't be happening, should it, really? These things do not discriminate. You know, it's not a certain social circle because um, it can happen to anybody. Somebody who hasn't got a safety net, uh, like a family or um, a steady job, or someone that has. One emergency, one problem, you know, can send your life spiralling downwards. The preconceived ideas that, that everyone's going to be after money and, and they're on drugs and they smell and they're dirty and they deserve to be homeless, all of that stuff's nonsense. I'll be honest with you, I walk past homeless people on the street in my 20s. You, you don't think it's going to be you, you know, you, you think you're above that and I, I'm, I'm guilty there, yeah, definitely. In Birmingham, the number of street homeless people has increased by 53% in the last year and by 588% since 2012. At the last annual count, there were 91 people sleeping rough on the streets every night. Sleeping rough has severe consequences for a person's physical and mental health. A further 20,000 people are in temporary accommodation or sofa surfing with friends and family without any long-term alternative on the horizon. Birmingham City Council are receiving 600 new statutory homeless applications every month and the number is growing. There are 12,900 on the housing waiting list. If the government is going to meet its target of zero rough sleepers by 2027, it's absolutely clear that more needs to be done. I grew up in care from the age of two until I was 18. Didn't really settle in one place, didn't really manage to kind of build positive relationships with a family. Um, struggled at school because of that, because I kind of felt different, felt like the kid that didn't um, fit in. My first kind of real introduction, I'd say, to drugs was um, the foster parents that I lived with um, when I was around about 17. Their son was a drug dealer, and then that just kind of led on to um, using Class A drugs. So I was, I was in a block of flats one day, somebody offered me um, some heroin. Within a few weeks of me kind of doing it for the first time, um, my life kind of spiralled that much and become that unmanageable and the drugs took such a hold of me and I ended up um, on the streets of Birmingham sleeping rough. I had a job and it was a full-time job. I even did extra hours and overtime but the problem was the company went bankrupt so a lot of people were out of work. I decided to go into a warehouse and that's when things went even worse because the government has rolled out the zero hour contract thing and I had no idea what it was and how it worked and it just hit me. Uh, I got a call from the agency saying, don't come into work until we call you. And it en ended up being about two or three weeks. So that was two or three weeks without any money coming in. So I decided to go into universal credit. And again, universal credit takes about four or five weeks before you actually get any money. I couldn't pay rent. I was living through our overdrafts. And after a while, I just couldn't afford to pay anything. It came from working a, a low paid job um, and, and just never getting ahead. I just work out an awful lot of hours, um, seven days a week a lot of the time for about a five year period. I mean, just, just surviving, literally on the breadline, surviving. The rent can almost be two thirds or three quarters of what you're earning a month. And that's, you know, you've got to live. And you've, if you've got a fun getting to work as well, you know, transport and everything else, very hard. I referred myself through um, Washington Court, came, came in the homeless thing, slept the night on the floor in the lounge there and um, got a room the next day after referral and assessment and everything else. Young people are presenting as homeless all the time and it's not a specific type of homelessness. Homelessness impacts young people in all different ways. Rents are very, very expensive and as always are increasing. They're on a limited income, you know, the national wage is, is not the same for them as it would be for URI. They have to make a limited amount of money stretch for gas, for water, for electric. At college, nobody knew I was homeless or rather in support accommodation. Depending on what time I'd start, I'd leave two hours early in order to walk there and then I'd walk back. I was, you know, spending money trying to figure out how on earth my mum would spend £20 and come back with like bags of shopping and I would spend the same amount of money and come back with like six, seven items. My sister was put into um, a forced marriage. Um, the attempt was then made for the same to be done to me. Um, that's when I decided to make a stand to say, no, um, I don't want you to do that to me. 
and that was when I suffered the full extent of the domestic abuse. I kind of lied and said that I was taking the rubbish out, but actually in that black bag were my belongings. Um, and I had to just literally open the front door, close it, and then the split second of somebody thinking you're putting rubbish in the bin, I had to run down to the bottom of the road. I went straight to a police station and that evening I was taken to um, a domestic abuse hostel. Um, I remember the manager opening the door and welcoming me in, um, taking me into her office saying that you're safe and we will support you. I constantly asked like, are they going to be able to get through the door? Are they going to be able to find me? And they were like, no, this place has got quite high security so they're not going to be able to get to you. I remember going to the shop the next day but with the hood of my coat over my head and every time a car horn beeped I thought it was somebody that had recognised me and that they were coming for me but obviously that wasn't the case. Having been homeless as a teen myself, I know that there's a huge amount of long-lasting effects and that can be to do with mental health, it can be to do with the way that you trust services and other individuals. I did suffer depression, um, I felt different to kind of everybody else. Waking up on the streets in a sleeping bag or in a car park, not having you know, somewhere to go and have a wash or, or food in the cupboards or, or a bed to sleep you know, or being around friends and family. Um, all of that stuff, you know, was difficult. All my school friends and other associates that I used to hang about with, I've lost all of them. Yeah, they sort of stepped away. They, they tried to reach out, but they didn't know what they were reaching out to. They didn't understand. One young woman, early 20s, was, is, was sofa surfing and she told me um, this guy put her up and he, he sort of offered her alcohol and everything. And then one night, she, like 3 a.m., she got a tap on the shoulder. A lot of clients have told me they feel invisible. A lot of clients have told me that they have been very seriously abused by people um, physically, sexually, um, emotionally, degraded and humiliated. Um, by people that don't understand their situation. People would say, um, why don't you get a job? What, why don't you sort your life out? You know, nobody really took the time to look, to look at you know, the reasons why I was in, in that position. It becomes more difficult then if you're homeless and you're trying to transition back into society if you've not felt part of that society for such a long time because people don't want to stop and talk to you, people don't want to have interaction, they want to turn their head and, and look the other way and, and act like you actually, you're not there and you don't exist. We need to take time out to understand and support people who we do see on the street and, and, and not avoid them. That person is a person with feelings, there's, there's situations that person's gone through that you possibly couldn't imagine. They're not um, a bit of dirt in the street that you can step over and... Rough sleeping is the most visual end of homelessness, but it's only a small part and a snapshot of the biggest issue. We've got people in temporary accommodation, families, people sofa surfing, and also we do know there's a huge population that are hidden homeless who haven't come forward and told us about their situation yet. There's a large proportion of households who are homeless who are families. Because they are covered by statutory legislation, you might not see them on the streets because they're actually in temporary accommodation, but that's still not ho a home for them. They are still homeless. We have over 2,700 families in temporary accommodation. That has a huge impact on the children in terms of their schooling, in terms of how distressing that can be for them. Birmingham City Council does build its own houses. We're the biggest council house builder in the country. However, it is not enough to meet the demand of the people. We need an additional 89,000 dwellings by 2031, and that's to accommodate the additional 150,000 people that will be moving to the city. But in addition to that, we need to make sure that we've got good supply at the moment to deal with the many people in temporary accommodation, and that's from hostels to properties to bed and breakfast. If you've got no fixed abode, how are you going to apply for a job? How are you going to print out a CV? How are you going to build and maintain proper social networks? So as, as human beings that we all need to develop friendships, to develop a sense of confidence. I found um, living in temporary accommodation very, very degrading. You lose all your sort of dignity and I like my independence and I think you lose that greatly, you know. Recently we've launched Barry Jackson Tower, 
which will be a temporary accommodation centre and was originally a tower block that was down for demolish. We've also got Magnolia House and that will, in addition, those two properties will give us over 200 bed spaces so we can move people into those rather than using bed and breakfast. Due to austerity, what has been created a whole host of broken systems and it's housing, it's support services, it's everything that relates to people, particularly who can be vulnerable. Locally we're doing a lot to try and prevent homelessness but ultimately we're sat in the middle of a crisis so it doesn't feel like it's enough. The government are focusing on rough sleeping at the moment but as far as I'm concerned that's not enough. Rough sleeping's gone up by 164% since 2010 so this is a moral and, and system emergency. More needs to be done about prevention and they need to invest in prevention. They need to be looking at their own policies that push people further and further into crisis. St Basil's works with young people aged 16 to 25 um, throughout the West Midlands. We've got 34 residential projects and I think over the last year we've helped more than 5,000 young people across Birmingham and the West Midlands. Birmingham is leading on the region's Housing First programme. We've got 9.6 million for across the region. Birmingham has chosen shelter. Uh, to deliver the Housing First service. You get people into the property and then you actually then provide the services, wrap that around them. Whether it be mental health services, um, substance misuse, whatever it is, whatever they need. Jointly with the local authority, we put together a unique team that worked with other agencies such as the NHS and other charitable organisations to engage with that particular community. It was raised to me that there was a real issue around uh, Mamba Spice, which is a drug. A client of mine has told me it's cheaper than the pint of, at uh, a cost of a pint of beer. My take on that was actually the only way that I could address that was doing background work on the wider criminality that was bringing those drugs into the city. And that drive of enforcement has seen an 80% drop uh, in member attacks. Education is everything, um, but realistic education, not just say no. I am an outreach worker now and I work in the homeless team at Change, Grow, Live. And I'm really, really passionate about my job. I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for me to be able to give something back to society as well and be able to help guys that are in the similar situation. I help women and children that suffer domestic abuse. Where we work at Shelter Birmingham, we offer an in-house domestic abuse project. There's other organisations such as the council, there's Women's Aid. Trident is an organisation that's been delivering housing care and support for over 50 years. We accommodate women, women with children that are in need of emergency accommodation to keep themselves um, safe from harm. If you think that you know somebody that is um, experiencing domestic abuse, then don't be afraid to speak to them because the person that you're asking will probably be really, really pleased that you did ask that question and that might be the point that things change for them. Change into action is an alternative giving scheme. It allows people to access that money and funding, but it makes sure that it is targeting those that are genuinely homeless across the city. You could have 10 organisations that work with a homeless guy in one day, and actually the thing that really stands out to them more than any of those organisations is somebody that walks past and takes five minutes to actually stand and talk to that person, you know, and ask them how their day is. When people used to actually stop and take the time to treat me like I was human, that would mean more to me than somebody giving me a hundred hundred pound on the, on the street. I think it's about, you know, society in general um, all taking a bit of responsibility for, for some of this stuff and looking at ways that you know all of us can do our own little part um, to, to try and tackle you know what is still a, a massive problem in homelessness. There's also the street link um, so if you see somebody that is sleeping rough that you're concerned about then contact street link and then they will get in touch with um, the outreach workers and the street intervention team that will go out and, and support that person talk to them about what their options are, hopefully encourage them into um, accessing the services. Before it escalates out of control and you find yourself on the street, I would try and get advice first. Try, try and almost like have a backup plan. 
what a lot of us tend to do is not ask because we, we're embarrassed, not realising that the help is actually there. You have to open up and be willing to learn through it rather than kind of like secluding yourself and going through it all alone. Don't suffer in silence because you will get that help and you will get that support. It's just that you've got to make that step. And that's probably one of the biggest steps that you're going to take, but it will be worth it and you will be free of everything that you're going through.